Okay, let me to start the webinar on time. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this webinar and thank you for attending on it. I am Dr. Fatima Shekhshwai, Assistant Professor in Medical Library and Information Sciences at Tehran University of Medical Sciences. As you know, this webinar is about research data management. Our speakers are from USA and Iran. This webinar is held by a School of Allied Medical Sciences in collaboration with the uh, Venice State University, Iran Cohort Consortium, Persian Cohort, and also a phrase to raise group of uh, international deputy of Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Okay, before we get started, let me to make some points. During the webinar, uh, the microphone and the webcams uh, access is closed for attendees uh, and at the end of this webinar we will have uh, a question and answer session with each other if you have any question or problem during the webinar please uh, write it down on chat box and my colleague and on uh, bring out uh, and uh, answer it let me turn the time to the first lecture dr katrin akers before she starts the lecture, uh, I would like to make uh, the, uh, I would like to make some information about her. Dr. Katrin Akers is the biomedical research and data specialist in the Schiffman Medical Library at Wayne State University. She formulates vision, set goals, and recommends policy leading towards the creation and development of program that expand the library's role in supporting research data management and sharing. As the editor-in-chief of the Journal of the Medical Library Association, JMLA, Katrin led the development and implementation of the first firm data sharing policy among journals in librarianship. Prior to working at Wayne State University, Katrin developed new research data management support program at Emory University and the University of uh, at the Emory University and the University of Michigan as a council for library and information resources postdoctoral fellow. Dear Dr. Akers, I would like to say thanks for accepting our invitation. It's up to you. Let me to a stop sharing thank you for thank you for uh the invitation and thank you for inviting me to to um speak to you all today i'm i'm delighted to be here so i will share i'll share my screen and get my slides up okay Okay, so I'm going to be talking to you today about um, organiza organizational research data management and its challenges, risks, and solutions. So, you know, what I'm focusing today is, is the library's role in supporting research data management. Um, and first of all, though, I'd like to talk a little, give a little bit of background about what is research data management um, and why is it important? So, I think it's really helpful to think about research data management, considering the entire um, research data life cycle. So, and I think this is really important when talking to um, faculty outside of library and information sciences who might not uh, who might not understand what we mean when we say research data management. Um, so, you know, research data you can think of it as having a life cycle where a researcher will plan how they will collect their data and how they will manage their data over the course of their research project. They'll collect their data, they'll process it, by, by, by which I mean getting it ready for analysis. They'll analyze it um, so that they can draw conclusions from the data. They'll visualize their data through charts and graphs. And then once um, a research project is done, you know, maybe you know, it's been published, Researchers also may think about how to preserve their data so that it will be made accessible to them in the future and to other people as well. 
So they may want to preserve it in a way that allows sharing of research data in reuse by other researchers. So properly managing research data throughout its entire life cycle is, is very important. Um, first of all, carefully managing research data means there's gonna be less errors in the data, right? If they're carefully managed, there's gonna be less errors, um, uh, less mistakes, and that increases the rigor of, of the research project. And then after a research project is done, uh, preserving the research data and sharing it um, is going to improve the reproducibility of the findings. So allowing other people to reproduce um, research findings and also allows other people to reuse research data um, to do secondary data analyses or to um, perform meta-analysis um, of multiple data sets, for example. Um, so that, and that is going to increase the, the efficiency of the research project and help advance um, uh, science and in, med in medicine. So I'm, today I'm gonna make the case that libraries can have a role to play through all of these research data lifecycle steps. And libraries are, are a, good, a good place on campuses to, um, for, to provide support for research data management because we have a long history of being we, by, by which I mean, when I say we, I mean library, librarians and information scientists. We have a long history of being experts in organizing information, disseminating information, um, also metadata, applying metadata to, um, to information resources um, so that they are more easily findable and uh, understandable by other people. And also librarians are often um, advocates for access to information, um, including the, you know, the, the more recent open access movement and open science movement. So it makes a lot of sense for research data management support to be um, provided by, by libraries. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go through each of these research data lifecycle steps uh, one by one to give you some examples of what libraries can do to support research data management at each step. Um, after that, I'm going to um, talk about a couple of the challenges or risks with um, libraries getting involved in supporting research data management on their campuses. And then I'm going to talk about give you some examples. So I've um, of kind of case studies, institutional case studies, because I've worked at three different three libraries at three different universities, and I'm going to talk about what their approaches uh, were to developing um, programs of research data management support, because every university is different. So first off, the planning stages. So. Here in the US, um, you know, a, a lot of research is funded through um, federal funding agencies, right, through the federal government. And over the last 10 years or so, these federal agencies have been increasingly um, expecting researchers to share the data um, that's generated um, through, generated um, by their federally funded research projects. Um, the idea is that taxpayers pay, tax, you know, U.S. citizens pay taxes to, um, to help fund this research. And so the results of that research, including the data, should be sh publicly shared back with the taxpayers. Um, so federal funding agencies here are increasingly expecting researchers to sh share their, the, the data underlying their research findings. So um, pretty much all funding agencies now here in the US require um, researchers to write up research data management plans or research data sharing plans that are submitted as a component of their, of their funding application. So in these data management plans, researchers describe what data they will collect, how they will process it, how, how they will analyze it, how they will store it safely. Um, and then after the project is done, how they will disseminate that data. How will they share it? Who will they share it with? Are there gonna be any restrictions on, on its sharing? 
Um, so libraries have, over the past 10 years, libraries here in the US have, have um, had a big role in helping researchers develop their data management plans for their funding applications. Um, a lot of times researchers may not know where to start, and so librarians can help help uh, them develop those, those um, data sh sharing plans. Um, even if researchers are not applying um, for, even if they're not required by the funding agency to write a data management plan, many researchers are still looking to develop protocols for, for managing research data for their labs or for their research groups, because graduate students may be coming in and out of the lab, but a PI, a principal investigator, might want everybody in their lab to um, manage the data um, in a similar way and kind of have common rules for the lab for how to manage their data. So librarians can help researchers develop these protocols for thinking about when data are collected, where are they stored? Um, are there any documentation developed um, to help um, describe the data so that it'll be understandable to others in the future? Um, how will data should be shared between lab members? For example, when someone leaves the lab, um, are they allowed to take their data with them, for example? Um, so librarians can help develop those protocols and librarians can also um, provide training to, to graduate students or to particular research groups, talking about kind of these best practices in, in research data management. In the next step, data collection. Um, a lot of times researchers might, maybe who are new to a particular research area might not have a full grasp on, on the best ways or all the different ways that they could collect data for their research projects. In my experience, I've seen this oftentimes with people who are doing survey research. Um, they want to know about different kinds of data collection methods and how to, how to recruit participants um, to complete surveys. And I've helped researchers um, kind of navigate that and figure out how they can um, best collect their data for analysis. After data is collected, but before it is formally analyzed, there's oftentimes a, a processing step where the data is, you collect the data, but then you have to get it in a form that's ready for analysis, um, a, form, a form that's ready for um, specific software, for example, to be able to analyze the data. This is often called uh, data wrangling or data munging. And what that means is, Oftentimes what that means is taking research um, data in one form and transforming it into like a different file type. Perhaps, perhaps it's um, that, yeah, you collect survey data with some online survey tool and then you have to export it and um, kind of organize it and get it into a different file that's ready for analysis. And sometimes these kind of file transformations can be quite complex and librarian, librarians can play a role in that in helping in either doing the data wrangling for researchers or providing consultation uh, and guidance for, for, for researchers. Um, not, this would require knowledge of uh, programs like, you know, fairly advanced programs for data analysis like Stata or R or Python, you know, might, uh, some of these require knowledge of um, programming language, it, but even Excel, because so many people use Excel to process their data, and um, a lot of people don't know how to use Excel very robustly. So even helping researchers use use Excel, um, and then in addition to kind of providing the training and providing the consultation, librarians can also provide training to researchers. Um, for example, like, you know, Excel workshops. Um, and then there's also, if you haven't heard of this, um, this is interesting, data carpentry workshops. Um, data carpentry is all about kind of this data wrangling. So it's kind of like carpentry, kind of like building data sets and transforming them from one, one file to another. And there is a robust curriculum available online, the data carpentry curriculum that is 
free and open for anyone to use so that you can host your own data carpentry workshops at your institution. When we get to the analysis stage, um, librarians, if they have the uh, right skills, they can provide consultation um, or to researchers on data analysis. This could be statistical analysis. If it's geospatial data, this could be geosp geospatial data analysis, like GIS data. Um, or they could, you know, do help, you know, help researchers do their data analysis. Also, data visualization. So creating charts and, and graphs that um, effectively and efficiently convey um, information to, to viewers. Um, librarians can provide, again, provide training on these topics, um, on various data analysis and visualization topics. Um, and they can also host researcher-led data visualization seminars. This is interesting. Um, NYU, New York University uh, hosted seminars like this where they, they were the hosts, but the lead kind of speakers at the seminar would be graduate students or postdoctoral fellows who would present their research and present some of the graphs and the visualizations that they were working on. Um, and it would be um, a seminar that was very, um, the audience would be engaged and the audience would ask questions about, about the visualizations and provide ideas for how to improve them. Uh, to make them more effective. Um, and that was a very successful seminar series uh, hosted by New York University. So there's a lot librarians can do in the, in the data visualization space. When it, and then when a research project is done, um, researchers will need to start thinking about preserving their data. They, they I know, they, there are very good reasons to preserve data after a project is done so that they can access it in the future or allow other people to access it. Um, and so when we think about preservation, we really start thinking about data repositories. And this is definitely a big area that uh, library, libraries have gotten into, into developing their own data repository for researchers at their institution. So there's two major ways that li libraries can engage in this. They can either build their own repository, for example, using Fedora software, or they can subscribe to um, a vendor hosted um, data repository. For instance, here in the, here in the US, there's a, a big general purpose data repository called Figshare. And institutions can subscribe to Figshare and kind of section off their own data repository just to serve the researchers at, at their university. Um, so librarian, libraries and librarians have been, um, have been very, and here in the US, they have been very interested in, in building uh, research data repositories so that uh, researchers at their universities, um, at their institutions have a place to put their data, to preserve it for the long term, and also to share it. This goes right into share the sharing step um, because the repositories hosted by libraries um, tend to be open access repositories um, that provide, that allow other people to download the data and reuse it. Um, a different approach, and I'll talk about this a little bit when I talk about Wayne State University, is hosting a data catalog where a data catalog doesn't store, an online data catalog doesn't store any data, but it, but it stores metadata about data sets. Um, and so, so it's, a, it's an online catalog where people can search for, um, for data records and the catalog will link out to the data set wherever it lives, even though it doesn't store data itself. So it's a wayfinder. It helps people discover data and find data. Um, I'll show you what we've done here at Wayne State. Um, in my experience, I've had a lot of researchers come to me and they don't really want to use an existing data repository, but they wanna build their own system to allow other people to access their data. 
Um, so I've done a lot of consulting on, on how the best practices and setting up kind of custom built data access systems for particular researchers or research groups. And again, libraries have a role to play here in training researchers, um, you know, um, teaching researchers about what the benefits are to, to, for data sharing, um, the best ways to go about data sharing. And something that's been popular at my institution is uh, researchers who perform human subjects research. And you know, how, how might they go about sharing um, human subjects data while at the same time protecting the confidentiality of, of, um, of the research participants and protecting their health information. And finally, the last step would be reuse. So when data sets are shared and made available to other people, then other researchers can find them, download them and reuse um, data for secondary analyses. Uh, in my experience, I've also done a lot of helping researchers find existing data sets that they can uh, perform further analysis on. Um, uh, these data sets might be data sets created by particular researchers, or they could be government data sets. Um, for example, you know, maybe a government agency collects data on the number of people who visit emergency rooms in the hospitals and, um, you know, what, why they visited it in an emergency room. Um, that's just one example. Um, a, a lot, we have a, here in the U.S., we have a lot of government data sets covering all topics, and um, it can be a challenge to, to use those data sets, to find those data sets and to reuse them. So libraries can have a, a big role to play there as well. So I'm going to talk about two big challenges um, for and kind of risks for library, libraries that want to develop programs of research data management support. One is that one person can't do it all. A very common model here in the US is a library will hire, will hire a research data management librarian and expect that person to do it all to do everything, to be the go-to data person um, and, and manage all of it and provide all the services and build all the resources. And that's not going to work. Um, it's gonna be much better. Sure, it makes sense to hire somebody who is 100% dedicated to research data management, but you can't expect that person to do it alone. That person's going to need to form a team um, of people who are also knowledgeable about research data management. And I'd argue that um, if, if a library wants to be in, um, build a program of research data management support, that existing staff should be retrained to some extent or upskilled so that they also understand research data management and can provide research data management for um, the users uh, that they serve. Um, and another challenge is that one library can't do it all. Um, a library is a library that builds a research, I would argue that a library that builds a research data management support program in isolation from all other campus offices, um, that's just not going, it's also not going to work well. Uh, I think it's really important for libraries to partner with other campus offices who have overlapping interests in uh, research um, and and, um, and partner, partner with those, like other, for example, um, at my institution, we have a division of research. Uh, we have the information technology office. So um, our library has taken great pains to partner with those to build resources together. Maybe you wanna build a repository together with the information technology office. Um, I think that's going to create more robust, stronger resources and services and increase awareness across campus of the library's role in supporting research data management. Um, so I would, yeah, really, really um, recommend that a library partner with um, other campus offices and departments. So I'm going to talk about kind of three kind of case studies um, of 
kind of just stories of how different universities here in the U.S. have come have come to develop programs of support for research data management. These are in three institutions that I have worked at over the past uh, 10 years. And in each of these institutions, I was hired to help develop and implement um, new programs of support for research data management. So Emory University is in Atlanta, Georgia. It's a me medium-sized um, university. The approach they took there was they right off the bat um, hired a, a research data management, or I'm abbreviating it here as RDM. Uh, they hired a, a, a full-time research data management librarian and a postdoc, who is me, um, to help develop a new program of research data management support. Um, what we did is we immediately formed a team um, of, peop of library staff who could, who had different perspective, who had different areas of specialty and who had different perspectives, um, who could help develop kind of a more robust program of support. So this team included people, included health sciences librarians, basic sciences librarians, metadata librarians. Um, we had like a geospatial, geospatial um, librarian. Um, so, you know, people who, have, who can come at research data management from different directions and have different, different perspectives. Um, one of the first things we did, the research data management librarian and I, was perform a faculty survey of uh, research data management perceptions and practices. So we surveyed faculty across the entire university, not just, um, not just health sciences, but all disciplines, right? And, um, you know, this was just to get kind of a baseline understanding of what do researchers think about research data management? What do they know about research data management? And what are they currently doing? Are they uh, currently, um, do they have formal protocols for managing their research data? Are they um, sharing their data with, with other people? Um, so just to kind of get a, a, an understanding of our institution, what are researchers doing um, <clears throat> in terms of research data management and how do they think about it? And we analyzed this data and, and we found some really interesting differences between um, faculty in different disciplines. So we looked at kind of health sciences faculty versus sciences faculty versus social science faculty versus arts and humanities faculty and found um, interest, really interesting differences in how they thought about research data management, what their concerns were, um, and their, their practices, how they act, actually manage their, their research data. Um, and so I think that goes to show that research data management is not um, kind of a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, I think it, it would definitely help to kind of tailor services and resources for different disciplines and different um, areas of study. So those were the first kind of steps we took to develop a program of research data management support. As that program matured, um, Emory de um, developed a repository or a data repository and started providing researcher consultation and training on all those different steps of the research data life cycle that we've already talked about. And, and Emory University continues to do this. This is what their um, data repository looks like at Emory. So they use the data, Dataverse software. This is software, data repository software that was initially created by Harvard University, um, but they have made, Harvard has made this software open source so anybody can go and download this software and install it uh, on their servers and create their own um, institutional or organizational data repository. So that is what Emory chose to do. This is not um, this is not a financially expensive financially expensive um, approach. It does require some server space and some some um, somebody with kind of. Uh, programming um, skills to, to, to set up the software, 
but this is pretty lightweight, pretty easy to use, and would be a good entry into um, developing a data repository. Once you, once you develop a data repository though, then you have to um, market it and make researchers aware of it. And that's also a big task, um, making researchers aware that there is this data repository um, and, and explaining how this using this data repository would be beneficial to them. So, so, so Emory has had this data repository for eight or 10 years and it's still fairly small. There's 43 total data sets in it, which is, which is not huge. Um, so this is a, a fairly small repository. Um, after working at Emory, I next worked at University of Michigan, which is different from Emory because University of Michigan is a very big, very, very big university, uh, very well resourced as well. Um, so their approach was they did not hire a research data librarian right at the start. Um, instead, they hired three um, research data management postdocs for two year kind of two year contract terms. I was one of those postdocs and uh, uh, we three postdocs were um, that was our job was to kind of plan for um, and develop a, a support program. So start exploring potential um, university needs, um, potential services and resources that we could offer um, researchers at, at the university to, to meet their research data management needs. So again, we formed um, a research data management team that was again comprised of health sciences librarians, engineering librarians, science librarians, metadata librarians, um, all scholarly communication librarians. Um, so a lot of different people who can provide, together can provide a much um, more holistic view of research data management. Instead of doing a faculty survey like we did at Emory, at University of Michigan, we kind of did an institutional survey. We, we per performed in-depth um, consultation with about 10 other universities to understand um, how other universities had developed, planned for, developed and implemented uh, research data management support programs, because there's a lot to learn from how other universities have done it. Um, so we performed um, you know, very in-depth interviews, phone calls, um, kind of scans of 10 other universities to, to understand their, their approaches so that we could use them as models and take, um, you know, take elements that worked well from other universities and apply them to our university. We ended up uh, publishing that as well. So we have a paper published um, um, that describes the biographies of, of other universities' approaches to developing data management services. Um, we also created um, a research data management and started creating a research data management website to kind of showcase um, the different services that we were developing. As, uh, the, as the, the kind of moving out of the development phase and um, actually kind of starting to implement these programs of support, that's when University of Michigan decide, decided to hire a full-time research data management librarian. And one of the interesting things we did at University of Michigan was to train um, our, all the subject specialist librarians. So we have, you know, librarian, we had like an anthropology librarian and a math librarian and uh, an, an English literature librarian, for example. So training all those subject specialists in research da data management so that it was not, the goal was that it's not going to be one research data management librarian who is the only expert and no one else knows anything about research data management. Instead, we wanted the subject specialists to also understand research data management. And from Emory University, I had learned that there are dis big disciplinary different differences in how faculty think about research data management and how they practice it. And so we um, encouraged, we kind of, we encouraged and provided kind of a map 
for how subject specialists be could begin to understand the research data management landscape in their particular disciplines. So for example, the anthropology librarian, you know, we, we um, helped that person explore what research data management is like in anthropology. So are there um, data repositories that specifically um, serve anthropology? What are the funding agency requirements? Do they require research data management? What are the main types of research data that anthropologists collect? Uh, what are their analysis methods? Um, you know, what, yeah, are there places for them to, to art preserve their data? Um, what are the benefits of sharing data in that discipline? Because there are very big, there can be very big disciplinary differences in research data management. Um, and I think a uh, data management support program is going to be more successful if there are subject specialists um, who are well-versed in what research data management looks like in their particular discipline. University of Michigan also, um, the library there had um, a number of experts on uh, geospatial data um, acquisition and analysis. And so that was folded into um, the library's data support program is very robust geospatial data support. They, University of Michigan built their own um, data repository using Fedora software um, called Deep Blue Data. And they continue to provide consultation and training on many different topics related to data management. This is what Deep Blue Data, their data repository looks like. Um, again, they kind of, they built this themselves using Fedora software. So this required a lot of um, technological um, resources. Uh, you would probably need a, a programmer on staff to do this. Um, and their data repository, again, University of Michigan is a very big university uh, and their data repository is, is quite populated. They have um, 453 data sets in here. Um, and, you know, this is across disciplines. Um, so they have a, a, you know, the University of Michigan has made a very good place for researchers to preserve their data and um, provide access to the data to, to other people. And finally, Wayne State University, that's where I work now. I've been there for about eight years. Um, Wayne State University is in, also in Michigan. It's in Detroit, Michigan. So it's about an hour away from University of Michigan. Um, so their approach was to, like many other universities do, hire a research data management librarian, uh, a full-time research data management librarian, who is me in this case. Um, as soon as I got there, I formed, again, a research data management team um, that had, you know, I kind of represented um, medical, bio, medicine, biomedical sciences. I had two other science librarians and a digital publishing librarian who um, had the kind of technological um, skills. So we had a small team. And what I had learned from my previous experiences at other institutions was that not only can one, one person can't do it all on their own, but one library can't, one library can't do it all on its own. Uh, I really um, started recognizing the value of a librarian, of a library partnering with other campus offices um, to increase the success of their um, services and resources. So we spent a lot of time um, doing outreach to campus partners. So university staff and other offices, division of research, information technology. Um, we did quite a lot of, of outreach so that they were, uh, people in other campus offices were aware of um, the skills we had in the library, the services that we could provide, and they could help us with marketing and um, awareness of the library as a site of support for research data management. Um, one, one thing that happened through all this outreach is that we found um, what I would call a faculty champion for research data management. We found a faculty member who was also, he was a medical faculty member and he was also um, 
I think a, a vice president of research, so pretty high up in the university. And he fully believed in um, open science and you know, the importance of sharing data and the importance of the library's role in research data management. So we finding him and partnering with him um, was very, very, very beneficial to our research data management support program. So that's some uh, other advice that I would give is find those faculty champions who can help you develop your services and um, spread awareness of those services across the university. So motivated by him, um, we built, we did not build a data repository because Wayne State, we just don't, we don't have the staffing and we don't have the monetary resources to actually build our own data repository. Instead, we built a data catalog. Um, and so we joined uh, a consortium of about 10 other universities here in the US called the Data Discovery Collaboration and um, used their open source software uh, that we run on servers at Wayne State to have our own um, data catalog. So again, this data catalog does not store any data files. Instead, it's just uh, a catalog of records describing available data sets. Um, so this is a government data set that I'm showing here. So if someone is interested in using that, they could um, click on this link, read about the data set, what's in the data set, what file types, how big is the data set, and then click a link and that will take them to an external website where that data set can be downloaded. This also data catalog approach also works very well with people who collect, researchers who collect data that they don't want to openly share because it's human subjects data that has protected health information, for example, um, that they don't feel um, would be ethical to publicly share. Um, in that case, we can describe a data set that they've collected, um, but not actually provide access to it. If someone was interested in using it, that person could contact that faculty member and ask if they can um, reuse the data set, uh, perhaps with a data use agreement. Um, so it provide, this data catalog is a good approach for um, helping people discover data um, that other, my, otherwise wouldn't be discoverable, um, but it doesn't actually store data. People would need to, to follow a link to go to, to a data set wherever it is. If it's on a government website, if it's in a data repository, if it's on a researcher's hard drive. So it's just a catalog of metadata records. Um, so this has worked well for us. We have over 100 um, data sets um, documented here. Um, and this is continuing to grow. So in conclusion, um, I hope I've made clear that libraries can be the principal campus locations for providing research data management training, um, consultation to researchers, and providing resources um, for data preservation and access. Um, the risks are that if, um, if you hire a, a single research data management librarian in isolation, that librarian may feel unsupported and just kind of not capable of doing a very big job that really requires a team effort. Um, and I've seen a lot of places that library services and resources, libraries may offer lots of services and resources um, related to research data management, but those services and resources can be underutilized by researchers. Um, and I think that risk um, can be overcome by partnering with other campus offices. Um, so that the services and resources created um, are really meeting the needs of researchers and to help spread awareness of, of those um, services and resources to researchers across campus. Um, so, you know, I would definitely recommend taking a, a team approach to providing research data management support. 
um, doing some retraining of existing staff so that they are knowledgeable about research data management and that they, they understand uh, the research data management within their particular disciplines to really kind of distribute knowledge of research data management um, across um, the library system. And so that the kind of the impact, the role of the library is just also distributed um, across campus. So that concludes my talk. I hope that is informative and um, I will stop sharing my screen. I don't know if we're taking questions now or at the end. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I hear you. I, I think uh, I love it from the Zoom. Uh, the, uh, the second lecturer is Dr. Dawood Khalili. I would like to say thanks for accepting our invitation. Okay, let me give brief description about him. Uh, Dr. Khalili is Associate Professor in Epidemiology at Prevention of Metabolic Disorder Research Center and Director of the Department of Biostatistics and Epidemiology in Research Institute for Endocrine Sciences in Iran and also uh, General Secretary in Iran Cohort Consortium. He's working on large uh, population-based cohort studies and data from primary health care services. He tried to pull data from different population-based cohort studies to develop and validate some clinical prediction models for cardiovascular diseases and diabetes. Now he's trying to develop a platform for data sharing among cohort in Iran cohort consortium. Dear Dr. Khalili, we up to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shari. Hello, You're everybody, welcome. and uh, good afternoon. Many thanks to Dr. Shari and Dr. Mansour Zadeh for holding this important webinar, actually, and thanks to Hakers, if I pronounce her name correctly, for her nice and informative presentation. And thanks for sharing their valuable experiences in different universities. Uh, with somehow different approaches for data management and focusing on team working. Uh, very good, thank you. Uh, I'm going to present uh, a case study from Iran Court Consortium. Let's, uh, I share my screen. Uh, Okay, you see my screen? Yes, Dr. Halili. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to present a case study from Iran Court Consortium with focus on uh, its data management challenges. Uh, first of all, let's ask, uh, let's see a motion graphy to introduce to introduce Iran Court uh, Consortium. Today, population-based cohort studies play a central role in medical research to discover the possible causes and predictors of diseases for improving public and individual health. The number of cohort studies is increasing worldwide 
and research collaboration maximizes the benefits of cohort studies. Pulling data from multiple studies can enhance the utility of existing projects, sustain their ongoing activities, and strengthen requests for further research funding. With regards to these benefits, the frequency of publications using pooled data has increased during the last decade. In our country, valuable cohort studies have been ongoing since the last two decades. Taiwan Liquid and Glucose Study, TLGS, Asfahan Cohort Study and Gulistan Cohort Study are among the first population-based cohort studies with 15 to 20 years of follow-up. Recently, the Persian cohort study has been conducted by 25 universities of medical sciences based on the stratification of all urine ethnicities. Considering the growing trend of cohort studies, the idea of establishing the Yuan Cohort Consortium, ICC, was introduced in 2014 by the Research Institute for Endocrine Sciences at Shanghai Beijing University of Medical Sciences, and it was approved by the Deputy of Research and Technology in the Ministry of Health and Medical Education in 2015. The One Cohort Consortium, ICC, is a virtual network of the Iranian population-based cohort studies and research centers with experience on related issues to enhance the power of cohort studies and direct their goals and aspirations more effectively with a view towards addressing health problem issues in Iran. The fundamental aims of ICC are answering to health problems not easily addressed in a single study through pooling data and promoting joint projects. Setting national research priorities in line with the mission of ICC. Integration of research to prevent parallel works and avoid additional costs. Establishing international cooperation with global research networks. The One Cohort Consortium tries to facilitate the collaboration of cohort studies by holding periodic joint meetings with the principal investigators of the cohort studies. The One is a pioneer in the promotion of population-based cohort studies in the region, and we hope to provide appropriate conditions for answering healthcare questions by improving national and international collaboration of cohort studies. Okay, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, because we aim to pull data for developing some uh, prediction models, uh, let's start with the concept of clinical prediction models at first. Uh, as you may know, clinical prediction models are useful for estimating patient's risk of having an outcome and certain diseases like colon cancer or breast cancer or experiencing an event in future uh, like uh, cardiovascular diseases or diabetes. Nowadays, these models have an increasing uh, important role in decision-making in clinical care by informing physicians, patients, and their relatives about the absolute risk of uh, the outcomes such as CVD or cancer. As you see, uh, this picture shows the increasing trend of using prediction models in science. A clinical prediction model is first derived from a developed data set, uh, usually named trained data set, and then its performance should be assessed or even must be assessed in different populations using validation data sets that usually named test data sets. Uh, well, sufficient sample size and emphasis on validation are among essential elements to successful modeling. Overfitting is a severe problem and large sample size is needed for estimation of 
uh, predictor effects, reliable model building, and reliable assessment of the model performance. On the other hand, the model generalizability should be tested in different settings. As a result, for both internal and external validity, we need to have access and handle large data sets from different sources. And it makes data management essential in clinical prediction models. Uh, for example, these issues happened in developing some uh, famous and well-known prediction models for cardiovascular diseases, like ACC AHA pooled cohort equation from the, for the assessment of cardiovascular diseases risk, uh, which used data from the cohorts of ARIC, CHS, Cardia, and uh, from Come Up Spring cohort, and also. Global risk risk score, which used more cohort studies, uh, I mean, eight cohorts from National Heart Lung Blood Institutes. And finally, recently developed WHO risk charts, which used 85 prospective cohort studies from emerging risk factors collaborations. Uh, now let's have a look at our study in Iran Court Consortium. We use data from four population-based courts called TLGS, Tehran Lipid and Glucose Study, with more than 18,000 participants, uh, GCS, Golestan Court Study, with more than 50,000 participants, ICS, Esfahan Court Study, with 6,500 individuals. And finally, Shahrud I court study with more than 5,000 participants. We use these data to estimate the CVD mortality rate and its difference between cohorts, and finally to validate some well-known prediction models for CVD and diabetes, and finally to, well to develop our own prediction model for cardiovascular mortality in Iran. Uh, well, first we held some meetings for advocacy and preparing memorandum of understanding for data sharing, and then prepared a data request form to describe the variables we needed in more details. Uh, if time let us to explain more about their request form. I will come back to that. Okay, let me explain some points regarding challenges we faced with uh, in this project. The main challenging was uh, that no metadata was available. So we had to request documents and papers re related to the uh, rational and design of the studies ask for questionnaires and data dictionaries. And also all cohorts introduced a contact person who was familiar with data. Uh, there was differences in measurements, units, and uh, some definitions in, um, for variables regarding exposures and outcomes. So we tried to harmonize the data in different ways, including uh, we unified the units, compute the same concepts from raw data. For example, we defined diabetes based on fasting blood sugar, two hours post challenging glucose, medication use, and self reporting history of diseases, and uh, had to translate uh, all outcome definitions to ICD 10 codes. And sometimes we used well known variables, for example, current smoking instead of using different definitions for smoking, for example, the number of cigarettes and so on. Uh, okay, and uh, for example, regarding the CVD mortality, uh, we used a hard outcome. CVD mortality is a hard outcome with the most agreement between codes, uh, but still we check total mortality among cohort studies to re uh, for reassurance 
of defining the mortality in the same definition for different causes of death in different court studies. Uh, there was different sampling and different response rates and different loss to follow up in different court studies. Uh, although there is no straightforward solution for these problems, but some statistical methods like using sampling weights and inverse probability weighting for those individuals remain in this study uh, based on the baseline variables uh, could help us to uh, address this problem. We did these statistical methods and fortunately the results didn't change and the, uh, the difference was ignorable and we could trust on our statistical analysis and uh, we uh, could see that loss to follow up or uh, different response rates didn't change our results. The other challenge was data cleaning. Cohorts had their own data cleaning, so we had no solution for that. Uh, I mean, cohort studies sent us their clean data. And so uh, we could not do anything regarding data cleaning here. And the other point was missing data. Fortunately, uh, imputation and complete case analysis had the same results. So we understood that missing data have uh, had uh, no serious, uh, serious effect on our results. And finally, uh, there was different follow-up times among different codes. So we had to repeat uh, our uh, analysis for different follow-up times, for example, for five and 10 years of follow-up and report all uh, results uh, due to five or 10 years of follow-up. These challenges led us to design this project, developing Iranian court studies, data sharing and request management platform. By this project, we will to uniform the documentation of court studies, including a study protocol, manuals of procedures and operations, questionnaires and other original study management documents and standardize research data format and prepare uh, standardized metadata for all court studies. And also we will uh, develop a web portal to provide a wealth of information on the Iranian court studies and make them searchable to the public. And finally, we will develop the data request management process, preparing research data distribution agreement and tracking the reuse of research data sets. Uh, our expected outcomes would be a research data management protocol for Iranian cohorts and a web portal containing a public profile for each cohort study and request system and finally, a series of workshops about how to standardize and uh, organize research data for court managers. And we hope, to go, uh, we hope that uh, we could uh, make familiar researchers with data management in this, uh, through this project and by following the results of this project. And finally, the impact of our project would be more transparency more efficiency and more helpful research. Uh, thank you so much for your kind attention. I'm ready for any question if there is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Khalili, uh, for your great presentation. And I must say, so I'm so sorry, at the end of Dr. Eker's presentation, I lost my uh, connection for seconds. Uh, and uh, I was say uh, I was telling thank you to Dr. Akers. I say again, uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Akers, for your nice presentation and uh, valuable insights about uh, research data management and libraries and librarian rules. Uh, the third uh, lecturer is Dr. Sadaf Sepanlu. I would like to say thanks for accepting our invitation. Okay, let me give some brief description about her. 
She received her MD or MPH from Tehran University of Medical Sciences. In 2005, she expanded her experience in data management during the one year period that she attended University of Texas in Dallas as a research assistant, 2008 to uh, 2009. She received her PhD in epidemiology in uh, 2015 from Tehran University of Medical Sciences. She's currently an associate professor of epidemiology in Digestive Re Disease Research Institute, DDRI, affiliated to Tehran University of Medical Sciences. She got involved in the largest cohort study in northeast of Iran, and also she was involved in past cohort study in south of Iran and in the nationwide Persian cohort, which is the topic of this meeting. She is also an active collaborator of the Global Burden of Disease, a study hosted by the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation in University of Washington. In short, she has experience of working with large data. Dear Dr. Sopanlu, it's up to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sheikh Shoy. Uh, thank you for introducing me and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present this lecture uh, here. I'm, I'm so yes. sorry, Dr. Sepanlu, can you uh, yes. turn on yes. your webcam? Thank you very much. Yes. I. Um, is it okay now? Yes, yes. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. Can you, can you see my... Uh, can you see my uh, uh, presentation? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about the prospective epidemiological research studies in Iran, or in short, the Persian cohort. At the beginning, I'm going to show you a clip about the overall uh, characteristics of the cohort study. From north to south, east to west, Iran is a multi-ethnic country filled with distinctive landscapes and climates and home to 80 million people. The diversity of lifestyles, environmental settings, and cultural customs among the different ethnic communities of Iran has led to highly varied disease patterns in the country. But what is common among them all is the alarming rise in non-communicable diseases resulting in over 85% of deaths today. To prevent non-communicable diseases, knowing the exposures and risk factors of disease are essential. Therefore, a nationwide cohort study, the Prospective Epidemiological Research Studies in Iran, the Persian Cohort for short, was launched in 2014 to capture a wide range of exposures. Conducted in 25 different locations, Persian is the largest cohort in the Middle East and Northern Africa. Persian has five major components. Birth, youth, adult, elder, and employee health cohort studies. Upon enrollment in any of the major components, laboratory tests along with various measurements and questionnaires are completed for participants who are followed up thereafter for 15 years. Blood, urine, stool, hair, and nail samples are taken and stored in the Persian cohort biobank. The blood stored is fractioned into serum, plasma, buffy coat, and whole blood. Given the environmental, socioeconomic, cultural, and genetic diversity of Iran, the Persian cohort is a valuable resource for research providing the opportunity for national and international collaborations, ultimately enhancing the health of Iranians and others.
Okay, as mentioned in the clip, the slogan of the cohort is to encourage research and to enhance health. Um, first of all, we had to select the sites of the cohort, Persian cohort. Uh, we set a certain, certain criteria for site selection. Uh, specifically, we selected sites to include all major ethnic groups within Iran and cover a large geographical region within Iran. We selected areas in which migration rate was low and in which these, these previous disease patterns were known. Uh, simply, finally, uh, we recruited over 170,000 individuals from 19 sites, men and women to 35 to 7 years of age and residing, residing in the designated areas. Okay, in these figures, you, maps you see, uh, on the left panel, you see the ethnicities included are Fars, Azeri, Kurd, Lur, Arab, Turkmen, Gilak, Tabari, Baluch, and Talish. Of, uh, in fact, all, almost all ethnicities in Iran have been covered and been recruited in the Persian cohort. On the right panel, you see the areas um, and the sites selected for Persian cohort include areas with different climates from deserts, semi-deserts uh, to forests and woodlands. Okay, the outcomes of interest were deaths by any cause and incidence of major non-communicable diseases, including cardiovascular diseases, cancers, digestive disorders, respiratory diseases, renal diseases, hepatic diseases, and neurological diseases. We also uh, examined the trends in major risk factors for non-communicable diseases, including anthropometric measurements, physiological characteristics, lifestyle, nutritional, and environmental risk factors. Uh, different tools and different questionnaires were, in, uh, were developed to uh, record each of these uh, uh, variables that we needed. The general questionnaire consists of a um, questionnaire for recording the demographic characteristics of the participants, the socioeconomic status, their occupation, their fuel exposure, lifestyle and housing, uh, including opium use, smoking and alcohol use, physical activity, cell phone use, circadian rhythm, and uh, contact with pesticides and toxin use. We use a very extensive food frequency questionnaire uh, to assess the nutritional risk factors and um, a questionnaire for, to assess the dietary patterns and food habits. There were also questionnaires for medical characteristics, including past medical history, reproductive history, family history, medication history, alcohol and drug use and smoking, dental health, anthropometrics, pulse and blood pressure, and physical examination. As mentioned in the clip, we collected blood, urine, hair, and nail, and stored them in a, a standardized uh, uh, labs, laboratories. And the lab tests are performed before storage. In this slide, you see the 19 sites where uh, portion the, were included in the Persian cohort adult study. Over 165,000 participants were included from September 2014 to uh, December 2018. And you see here the size of the adult cohort study. You see that north, west, south, east, uh, uh, provinces have been selected as a study sites for the cohort, for the Persian cohort. Uh, there were also parallel studies, parallel to Persian cohort. These mentioned, were also mentioned in the clip, the birth cohort, youth cohort, adult cohort, elderly cohort, and employee cohort. Okay, the birth cohort objectives were to investigate the relationship between human development and the genetic characteristics, the reproductive factors, perinatal care, socioeconomic status, 
cultural factors and environmental factors during infancy, childhood, and adulthood. Overall, 15,000 infants of both genders were recruited in five provinces of Sari, Semnan, Esfahan, Yaz, and Rafsanja. The youth cohort was focused on psychiatric disorders and conditions, including depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, opioid, alcohol, and methamphetamine use disorders, psychological distress, and overall, over 10,000 participants of both genders were recruited in four provinces. Uh, the I cohort was in, actually embedded within the adult cohort, six, six sites out of the 19 overall sites of the adult cohort also recruited participants uh, to follow the eye disorders, to determine the prevalence of common eye diseases and to determine the degree to which eye disorders affect individuals' general health and well-being. Over 65,000 participants were uh, recruited in six uh, uh, sites embedded within the Persian adult cohort. You see here the sites where eye cohorts uh, are launched. And finally, the elderly cohort was launched to monitor the changes in health and well being and assessment of different needs during the aging transition to explore the relationship between a range of risk factors, protective factors and health aging and longevity, land, healthy aging and longevity, and to identify the basic infrastructure needs, social needs, home care, to initiate a new car and to improve the current system for all population in Iran. A total of 15,000 men and women over 50 years of age were recruited in, Trusa, in three sites. Uh, here you see the sites. And finally, in the employee cohort objectives, uh, in, in the employee cohort uh, study, um, 54,000 employees from the participating universities, from 12, 12 universities were recruited to identify the risk factors specifically occupational risk factors, which were associated with non-communicable diseases, psychological risk factors, specifically on occupationally related psychosocial issues, such as depression, anxiety, stress, quality of life, and overall life satisfaction. And these are the sites of the employee cohort study. Okay, we have also uh, launched a web page the version cohort.com where uh, all uh, uh, descriptions and introductions to cohort sites and description of parallel cohort studies uh, are available. Um, two core uh, manuscripts have been published based on the protocol of the Persian and the, uh, the platform and also over 30 published st studies and 20 submissions are the result output of, of this cohort. Uh, Persian is also a member of International 100,000 Cohort Consortium, Asian Cohort Consortium, and uh, in, we are collaborating with NCD Risk Project at the Imperial College London. Okay, after introducing the cohort, we now uh, are, uh, arrive at describing data management in Persian. Uh, personally, I think data management starts from the first step of designing and conception of the study. After defining the goals and objectives of the study, the type of data that should be uh, collected during this study should be defined and the procedures should be made to ensure the quality of the data that is going to be collected, uh, stored, and used finally. Um, at the latest stage of the project. So the next step would be development of data collection tools to ensure the quality of data and the type of data that we need from this uh, study. Uh, later, the procedures of data collection should be defined, data storage should be done, and finally, data will be analyzed and the data sharing proper uh, procedures should be made. Uh, Okay, 
In the first step, the proposal for the study was developed. The goals and objectives were defined. Types of data were defined. The proposal was submitted by Digestive Disease Research Institute to Medic Ministry of Health. Budget and ethics were approved. The core team was formed. The study sites were defined and pilot study was conducted. Uh, the next step was to develop data collection tools. Um, the main uh, questionnaires included a questionnaire on demographic and baseline data, a questionnaires, questionnaires that were previously validated in Golestan cohort study, including, for example, uh, questionnaires on past medical history or questionnaires on smoking, alcohol use, and opium use. They were all previously validated in Golestan cohort and were used again here in the Persian. Uh, there was a number of standard valid questionnaires that were translated to Farsi, such as the quality life of life questionnaire, uh, the physical activity questionnaire, uh, sleep uh, quality uh, questionnaire, which were uh, validated uh, and translated to Farsi. And other questionnaires that were validated in the pilot study of the Persian. Uh, there were also protocols and equipments were defined for physical examinations, and protocols and equipment were defined for collecting biosamples. Okay, the, the study sites were selected based on checklists filled out by the core team. Core team. Uh, the core team decided to se uh, select the study sites based on the presence, uh, presence of experts who, were, um, who had experienced in launching research studies, the existing personnel uh, of the site for conducting the study, logistics of the sites, and equipment of the sites. And after site selection, the project was uh, assigned to the principal investigator uh, mainly uh, one of the uh, directors of the medical university uh, by the core team. Uh, the pilot study was conducted on 14,000 participants, the sample size by defined, protocols for logistics, equipment, and the required budget allocated by the medical university was defined, protocols for training, protocols for monitoring, protocols for quality assurance and control, and development of a central server for data entry. Uh, here is the site where you can find the detailed protocol booklet of the co cohort study. The same protocol has been used by all cohort size and same educational team trains personnel equally uh, the, at all cohort size. And the uniform uh, protocols and uniform procedures is the main strength of the Persian cohort study. Okay. Uh, the human resources involved in the study is the first, the principal investigator, which uh, is assigned by the medical university, a supervisor who reports monthly to the core team, the manager who overviews the flow of recruitment, interviewers, technicians, and a QC technician in charge of quality control for lab and biobank and data cleaning, who is under the direct supervision of the core team. We developed several checklists to ensure the quality of the data collecting and data storage processes, a checklist for assessing the criteria for inclusion of a study size, as mentioned before in my previous slides, um, checklist for preliminary workshops, advanced workshops, surprising visits by the core team. Uh, some, uh, from time to time, the core team surprisingly visited the study size to check if everything is going on uh, according to the protocols. Uh, the PI monthly visited the sites and filled out the checklist. The QC technician uh, filled out the checklist for quality control. And uh, the core team, during their surprising visits, checked the satisfaction of participants. OK, after uh, doing the pilot study, defects were detected. And checklists were corrected, questionnaires, procedures of biosample collection were uh, corrected, personnel were re educated, and the smart online questionnaire for data entry was modified and uh, optimized. 
A study sites were given two to four weeks to detect the defects and um, correct the, the problems. Okay, the next step was the online data entry and management. Data collection is web-based. Centralized data collection server in Tehran in uh, SQL Server 2020 hosted in is hosted in DDRI Charity Hospital and it is accessed through both internet and intranet. The software can be used in laptops, tablets, and cell phones. A firewall was developed to prevent potential hackers. A backup is taken from the server every four hours and kept at three physically separate locations. The server questionnaires are completely smart to reduce possible mistakes and the questionnaires will be checked by field managers at the end of each day. Uh, data collection and entry is completely web-based. Data are rechecked immediately after entry. Data are transferred to the centralized uh, server. Each university has access to its own data, only to its own data. The level of access is defined for each individual in the study sites and only the core team has access to the pooled centralized data. There is also a policy, policy to use pooled data, which I will explain here. Okay, central and local teams observe data collection routinely, as mentioned by surprise visits by central team, participant satisfaction surveys, and uh, random interviews uh, to record the quality of the interview. And the data cleanup is performed centrally. Okay. From 2014 to 2020, over 163, 700 participants were recruited. Data entry was completed. Data cleaning has been accomplished centrally. And biosamples have been stored in freezers and labs in study sites. Okay, this is a timetable. As you see, the proposal writing uh, started in 2013. Uh, meetings with officials at Ministry of Health and at province and local levels were set, arranged to uh, convince the officials um, for launching the studies. Uh, the infrastructure were set, necessary equipment were purchased. Primary audit of the project in infrastructure was done and managers were trained in the pilot study. Um, close monitoring was done by principal investigators and uh, primary analysis was done to find the, the mistakes. And at the end, in 2014, the main phase started. Okay, this is uh, simply a repetition of what I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, at first, the project was developed and designed. A standardization, uh, a standardized tools were used to collect data, pilot testing of data tools, training of interviews, uh, interviewers as technicians were done, pilot studies were done, data were cleaned up, interviewers and technicians were retrained. The main study was done. Uh, supervisors, both national and international, supervised, supervised the study and also supervised the follow-up. Okay, this is the organizational chart of the Persian cohort. This is the core team, there is a consultant team, and there is a national quality control team. The core team uh, has educational um, subgroup, executives committee, software committee, and laboratory committee. And the, execute, the educational committee is in charge of uh, training the personnel. The software committee is in charge of launching the web-based the web um, software. And the laboratory committee is in charge of setting up laboratories and uh, all equipments required for uh, biospecimen uh, collection and storage. Uh, the executive committee overviews this university's executive committees in each of the sites. The consultant team, um, in fact, uh, has scientific subgroup and epidemiologic subgroup. The scientific subgroups overviews the medical, nutrition, and laboratory uh, to tools for data collection. 
And the National Quality Core team uh, controls the quality of the laboratories and also controls the whatever the procedures in the field that had, uh, takes place in the field. And the university quality control is supervised by the national quality control team. Okay, this is the procedure for follow-up. Annual telephone or active contact with participants is made. If the participant is diseased, uh, the central team goes to house and completes a verbal autopsy to define the di diagnosis, the cause of death. And if the participant is alive, it is uh, questioned, she's in, she or he is inquired whether she has had any major event. If no major event has happened, the follow-up is complete. If uh, she or he had a major event, the cause will be inquired based on the medical documents that she has. And the final diagnosis will be done, uh, made by uh, physicians who diagnose both the cause of death or the cause of event. And the follow-up period for adult cohorts is annually, for birth cohort is every two months, for youth cohort is annually, for elderly cohort is every six months, and for all cohort and employee cohort is done annually. Repeated measurements are done every five years, till 15 years. And for data sharing, uh, the central team uh, sets up uh, open calls for pre-proposals and proposals. The uh, central scientific committee assigns, assigned, have assigned four PIs uh, to review the proposals that are submitted to the call. The protocols for authorship have been developed and data and sample transfer agreements have been developed to be signed by the person who sent the proposal and wants to uh, uh, get the, obtain the data. The site, there's an active site on the Persian cohort website where proposals can be submitted and um, will be assessed by the um, central scientific central team to see if the pro, if the project is um, adequately detailed to be performed on the data of the cohort. Uh, and these are the photos of pilot phase in uh, different sites of Iran in the Persian core. Well, the main challenge of the study was the variety in cultures, languages, and outcomes of interest across study sites. And site-specific challenges were detected during the pilot phase and corrections were made in the procedure of data collection and entry. And finally, education was tailored according to local requirements. And the solutions, the main strength of the Persian cohort is the unique protocols for selecting a study sites, protocols for establishment of logistics, budget, human resources, protocols, unified protocols for education, unified equipment for data collection, unified protocols for data entry, unified protocols for quality assurance and control, and finally, unified procedures for data storage and cleaning and data sharing. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Spanlu, thanks a lot for your valuable information about cohort studies. Okay, it is turn off question and answer session. If you would like to ask question from our speakers, you can raise your hand and we will give you access to microphone and webcam. We are waiting for you. Okay, Dr. Khalili. Hello again, and thank you for the presentations and for managing the webinar. Uh, I have the two questions from Akers, uh, Professor Akers. Uh, uh, I have two questions, please. 
Uh, is data management plan mandatory in the university work with those universities? Uh, is, it is, is it mandatory for proposal submission? Or, and if not, in which phase research investigators have to submit their DMP? Thank you. Yes. So a research data management plan is mandated by uh, federal funding agencies here in the US. So that would be National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, and we have a bunch of other federal funding agencies. Um, so they require that data management plans are submitted um, as a part of the funding application package. Um, so they, you know, they submit their proposal for research funding describing the research project, and they also have to submit a research data management plan describing how the research data will be managed during the project and shared after the project. Um, it's, so it's not required by the university, it's required by the funding agency. Um, and the quality of the, of the research management plan um, can affect um, decisions uh, about whether to fund particular researchers or research projects. Um, so that is, that is one big mandate is federal funding agencies. Um, another mandate that I didn't mention in um, my um, presentation, but which is still very uh, relevant, is a, a number of journals now um, have data sharing, journals have data sharing policies where it might be the journal's policy that the data underlying the research results be shared publicly um, or with other researchers. Um, and that's to increase the um, rigor and reproducibility of the research findings. Um, so it's increasingly common now that when researchers submit uh, manuscripts to a journal that um, that journal might have a research data sharing policy that requires you to place uh, the research data in a data repository uh, or otherwise provide um, access to to research data. So here in the U.S., those are probably those are kind of the two um, two big mandates, uh, two big requirements: is federal funding agencies require data management share, data sharing and some journals, um, an increasing number of journals require data sharing. Thank you so much. Uh, regarding the journals, how do you check the validity of the data? I mean, how do you confirm that the data sent to you is correct and is uh, full and, and the variables is the variables that have been used in the manuscript and so on? Right. Um, it probably varies by journal how they check that. Um, in some cases, the data is the, the data files, um, the data sets are made available to the peer reviewers. So if the peer reviewers want to check the data and make sure that the findings described in the manuscript um, can be derived from the data, reviewers would be free to do that. Uh, or reviewers might um, comment on, um, you know, how organized the data are, um, or, you know, do the data match the, the, um, the research results. Um, and there might be some editorial, you know, like in the editors of a journal might do some checking to make sure that the data look valid and reliable. Um, but for the most part, I, I don't think there's a whole lot of checking. I think it's an honor system right, where researchers provide, provide access to the data. Um, and you have to have some degree of trust that that data is reliable and, and valid. Um, but having that data available, data available makes it possible for others to do that checking if they want to. Okay, thank you so much. And mm -hmm. another question is that, uh, is there any enterprise or company to prepare or give data management services to universities and individual principal in investigators? I mean, private companies. Right. 
Well, we have here in the US, we have private companies that um, have data repositories that provide data repositories. Um, so, you know, a place to put the data, to preserve the data after research is complete um, or during the research project. And it provides an access mechanism, a way for other people to find data and um, access it, download it. Um, so that's where kind of the commercial enterprises come, come in. Um, Fig, I mentioned in my presentation, Figshare is one of those. Another one is um, Mendeley Data. Another one is Open Science Framework. So, and so for some of these, they allow institutions to basically kind of set up, segment off a part of the repository so that that's, that uh, showcases research data sets just from a, a single institution. And that's oftentimes available for like a subscription fee. Um, and it can be quite expensive. <laughs> so that when a university is considering um, developing a data repository, that is a big decision, whether to build your own, uh, perhaps using open source software, or whether to use a commercially available um, system, which um, so you wouldn't have to have a, a, a computer a developer, a programmer on staff, but it does cost, it can cost quite a lot of money to subscribe to these kind of commercial solutions. But there are currently no um, commercial enterprises that provide kind of that individual researcher level consultation. Um, that is, I think, best done person to person, you know, by a university employee, such as a librarian. Um, yeah, and so the commercial enterprises are here mostly just provide the, the actual data repository systems. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Dr. Khalili and Dr. Uh, Eckers. Uh, I didn't see any raising hand uh, and any uh, message and chat box. Uh, I, uh, I'm going to thank you very much again to Dr. Eckers, Dr. Khalili, uh, Dr. Sepandu for your valuable presentation. And thanks a lot the attendees. Uh, if uh, it is possible for you, I have a request. Please turn on your webcams and we can take your photos. Sorry, Dr. Shai, if uh, nobody asks a question, yes, I have another Yes, question. I know, Dr. Khalili. Sorry. Yes, yes. Sorry. No problem. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the question is uh, Do the software check for the similarity between studies for pooling data? I mean, uh, can we check the similarity between studies and find that these the data of these studies can be pulled and uh, empower the uh, the power of study? I mean, do you understand my question? Actually, yeah. is that a question for me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the only software that I know. What I'm thinking about is like systematic reviews and meta-analyses of previous clinical trials, for example, or, or cohort studies. Um, I, there are some, you know, I'm sure you're probably familiar with this kind of software available and, um, for pooling, kind of doing meta-analyses. Um, I'm thinking of the Cochrane uh, Collaborations RevMan software that you can use to do meta-analyses. That's the one that I'm familiar with. Um, no, let, me, let me ask in another okay. way. Okay. Uh, is there any system to check the similarity between variables in different studies and select the variables that are the same between uh, studies? You mean? Uh, do you understand? Yeah, okay. I don't, under I, I don't know of any software that does that. Kind of in an automated fashion. Um, yeah. To my knowledge, that's just um, 
manual human human judgment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, okay. And uh, I say, uh, I have a request from all attendees. If it is possible for you, please turn on your webcam to take a photos for our webinar. Is it possible for you or not? Let's please turn on. on. Problem with my webcam. And except Dr. Khalili, it except. <laughs> work. Yeah, it doesn't work, sorry. Except it's Dr. Like Khalili, this. yes. <laughs> Yes. Dr. Sepalu, is it possible for you and the others attendees? Are you there? Okay. I think I Dr. Sepalu left the webinar. Yeah. No, no, she's here. Yes. And the other attendees are there. I don't know. They have access, I think, to the webcam. Uh, Ms. Ala Edini, uh, the attendees have access to the uh, webcam or not? Please give them access to them for turning their webcam. I think it is afternoon in the uh, evening in uh, Iran uh, and all of our attendees. Okay. Uh, okay, I would say it, uh, goodbye uh, and uh, thank you. And I wish a good time for all of you and good weekend for Iranian participants. Thank you, Dr. Rikers. And thank you, Dr. Khalili and Dr. Sepanlu and the... Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Akers. Thank you, Dr. Shai. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye.